My name is Nahad. I'm with UNICEF uh, Menaro. I support the immunization system strengthening. The title of my presentation is uh, Progress is Possible but Not Inevitable, meaning progress cannot just be by accident. It needs to be deliberate. And this is a title I stole from a video that's coming up in a minute, which I should have checked the sound. I hope the sound would work. Uh, yeah. There you go. OK. Kamel already mentioned uh, the great partners we have in this room who uh, inspired us and supported us tremendously for the preparation and organization of this workshop. At UNICEF, we're, it's not very kosher for us to thank our own people, but I really do want to take a moment and thank uh, someone who does all the dirty work behind the scenes to make sure that the rest of us and his team can do our job well. He's the one who deals with the bureaucracy and the bureaucrats very well, in fact. And that allows us then to do the fun stuff. And that's Kemal Sanusi. I don't know where he is now. I think he stepped out of it. Where is Kemal? There he is. OK. So thank you, Kemal, for all your behind the scenes support. So the outline of my presentation is uh, threefold. And I'll try to go th quickly through the first two, which is the global and regional updates. And then we'll spend most of the time in the third area, which is on the equity part. And if nothing else, I hope you walk away with this key message or takeaway after this presentation or even after this workshop. And that addressing inequities in immunization is not only a moral imperative, which is probably intuitive to all of us in this room, but also it makes economic and programmatic, and by programmatic I mean outcomes and performance. It makes economic and programmatic sense. And achieving equity is possible, but not inevitable. So it takes all of us in this room, plus many others, to do the little work which will make big difference in achieving equity. And that's achieving that last child, okay? So with that in mind, I'd like to share this video, which many of you may have seen already. It's a good reminder of why we do what we do, and that we are making progress in child health, and we should celebrate our successes, but that progress is not by accident, and we still have a lot of work to do. Now, some of you, I presented this slide in uh, July. I asked, uh, do you know what this number stands for? Any guesses? For those of you who weren't at the workshop, any guesses? It's not my age. Four? Okay, good. It's a good guess. It's a good guess. It's a bit more optimistic than that. So in fact, it's from a recent publication that estimates that for every dollar invested in immunization, we have $44 in return. So that's our net return. So immunization is a pretty good buy, yeah? Those are odds that I take any day. How about this number? It's not my personal wealth. Any guesses? Cost of vaccines, very good guess. Again, a bit more optimistic than that. <laughs> In fact, this is the broader economic and social value of vaccination from 2001 to 2020 estimated. So that's pretty good. That's more than many of our countries put together several fold in terms of their GDP. So that's pretty good. Again, a very good buy. Just a reminder of we're in good business here. Yeah? Of course, you know we're all guided by, in our work by GVAP. At UNICEF, we also have a roadmap uh, which takes us until 2030. And the work that we're doing today and uh, as part of our equity agenda falls under this particular uh, column under equity. Just a couple of quick slides fresh off the press on the latest data. So in terms of access to immunization, we're at globally at 91%. This is including 2016 data. In terms of DTP3, so basically continuation of the coverage, we're at 86%, not much different from last year. And you can see several years of stagnation. So the flip side of that, of course, is that we have nearly 20 million infants globally who are under vaccinated or unvaccinated based on the 2016 data. And 82 percent 
So eight out of 10 of these children who are under vaccinated or unvaccinated live in the 73 Gavi eligible countries. And if we were to stratify the data by income, we see that 78%, so that is the lower income countries, on average, they have 78% coverage, compared to the higher incomes at 96%. Any guesses what the percentage for the Gabi eligible countries is at this point? Any guess? Is it lower than the lower income or higher than the lower income? So in fact, it's uh, on par, it's around 80%. Okay, this, is in, uh, this slide is on the dropout. So we're looking at 91% uh, coverage on DTP1, right? You look at the difference with DTP3 divided by DTP1 and you get your dropout. And you see that many of the countries, especially in our region, are at the zero to 10% dropout uh, with a few countries at higher dropout rate. So utilization is something we also need to look at the demand side as well. So not just the supply side, but also the demand side. And a quick slide on the global measles cases and coverage. Specifically, I wanted to raise your attention to MCV2, which is globally at 64%. Okay, so when uh, today and tomorrow we talk about uh, second year of life, immunization during second year of life, this is something we should consider. Of course. This is by schedule, which means some of the countries have uh, their second dose of measles uh, vaccine at maybe school entry or what have you. But nevertheless, you can see it's substantially lower than the first dose. So that covers the global. As I mentioned, I'm going through it very quickly. So now a few slides on the regional. At the regional level, we are guided by the MVAP, which is the GVAP version for our region. And in our region, and when I say our region, I'm talking about MENA, Middle East and North Africa. So it's a little bit different than the Eastern Mediterranean region where our sister agency, WHO, navigates. We have Algeria in our region, but we don't have Somalia, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. We have a birth cohort of nearly 11 million in our region. And our countries are categorized in terms of income and World Bank breakdown into these categories, okay? So the Gavi eligible countries, Yemen, Djibouti, Sudan, Sudan is going to go through a transition process, and Syria is partially eligible for Gavi support based on the fragile policy of Gavi. And then the rest of the countries you see here, the ones in red are the ones that we invited to this meeting because of the particular topics that we are covering, okay? So now, just a few slides on the demographic trends in our region. This is in 1990, the urban population trend, okay? And I put the lens on our region. I don't, you don't need to under, like, get into the specifics. I just want you to see how the bubbles increase. And the bubbles increasing, basically the circles uh, increasing show the urbanization trend, okay? So look at our region. Cairo and Tehran are the mega cities with a few blue dots, and look at 2014 now. The rate of urbanization in our region, right? Now this busy slide, I, you don't need to look into it, I kept it here on purpose so that you have it as reference. This particular slide, first of all, if you look at the 1950s, and the yellow are the ones invited to this um, um, workshop, and then you look at the estimates in 2017. Look at all of them, almost all of them have doubled in terms of urban population. Okay, in terms of urban population, okay? And then let's take Djibouti. Djibouti is at almost 80% urban population, right? Compared to low-income countries of 55%, you see 20, more than 20 percentage point higher. Sudan, it's on par with, I guess, lower middle income countries now since it's transitioning there. But then look at what's happening here. In Sudan, 92% of the urban population are living in slums. 
and these are the rest. And the colors are based on estimates versus models and all that. Okay, so Djibouti, 66% slum population. Okay. So this is spe especially Sudan, I wanted to highlight 92% slum population. Of course, very relevant to our region, as Kamel mentioned earlier, given the political upheavals and the economic instabilities, is persons of concern. This is a UNHCR uh, definition or, or parameter, people of concern, which include the IDPs, the returnees, the refugees, of course, asylum seekers, so on and so forth, okay? Globally, around 68 million. Look at the center of gravity. It's our region. And look at the numbers here, please. Syria, Iraq, and then the rest. Yeah, I'm not including other countries like Iran, uh, chronically dealing with persons of concern and so on and so forth. Okay? So we should ask ourselves, given the demographic trends, the political upheavals, Really, what's the impact on immunization programs? Yeah, the ones you're managing at subnational level or national level, and outcomes, right? So if we have data, we should look at data to see what the impact is. If we don't, if all we have are opinions, then let's go with mine, which is a joke, because we have data. And we see that in our region, 88%, we say, DTP3 coverage based on 2016 data. But 88% is just an average. There are countries that are pulling it up, you see? Yeah, in the higher 90s. And then others that are down. So it's not like all of them are at 88%. We see a big gap. And of course, we know the reasons. Many of us in this room know the reasons. Here, I'm showing the data based on Pre-Arab Spring and post-Arab Spring. Post-Arab Spring being 2016, pre-Arab Spring being 2010, and then also in the middle, I took the 2013 data just to see what happened after a couple of years. And we see, of course, Syria and Iraq. We see a dip in the coverage from 2010 to 2016 for obvious reasons. We see Djibouti sort of going up and down, and we see Yemen sort of dipping down, okay? In Sudan, interestingly, we see a bit of an increase. And then other countries like Lebanon, Jordan, Libya, Tunisia, perhaps due to stronger health systems, they've been able to manage the upheavals and the instabilities. But we should not take that for granted. How much longer can they handle the persons of concerns, for example, in their countries and the economic pressures? So it should not be taken for granted. The flip side is that we have nearly 1.3 million children who are un unvaccinated or undervaccinated in our region. And nearly 90% of them, 88% are in the five MENA countries that have been dealing with, of course, the political upheavals and the Arab Spring and post-Arab Spring issues. Okay? But this is a bit of a, I guess, good news compared to 2015, where we have 1.4 million unvaccinated children, and 91% of them were in these five countries. So DTP coverage versus dropout. So this is DTP1, DTP3, and dropout here. So you can see the differences between 1, 3, 1, 3, and then dropout here. But interestingly, I want to spend more time on this slide. So here, in 2010, versus 2015, DTP1, so that's access versus utilization, right? The dropout that we see, right? So 2010, this is pre-Arab Spring, 2015 last year, okay? So Djibouti here, we see dropout. We see they're doing okay in terms of accent, access, but they seem to have utilization issues. So any intervention for Djibouti should somewhat focus on the demand side, okay? Of course, Iraq, we see it's a hell, basically immunization system issue. Syria, we see it's a system issue. And then in Yemen, we see access is an issue, and dropout seems to be OK, right? There isn't much difference between dropout. So the intervention here in Yemen would focus on access issues. This kind of analysis is useful in terms of our planning purposes. Of course, you have to triangulate with other data. To verify. Now here in 2016, 
Okay? We see a bit of difference here. We see that in Iraq, they seem to have worked very hard on the dropout, the demand side. Again, assuming the data quality, all that stuff, right? If the data quality is okay, then we can assume they did a great job on the demand side. Still, they have access issues. In Yemen, it seems like, again, the dropout, the demand side was affected. And this probably makes sense because we've had a lot of rumors around vaccine hesitancy in Yemen. You may have heard of these issues uh, in, in this particular year. So it may have affected our dropout. This is our measles coverage. 88%, I was surprised it's quite high. I double, triple checked, but it is. I guess there are countries like, I think, Egypt and Iran that are pulling the numbers up. But again, it's not like all of them are at 88%, and that's what I want to caution us against in terms of averages, right? 88% means nothing to me, frankly. Unless we're talking to a politician, we want to sound good. But we can see a lot of countries are pulling the numbers up, and then the rest of the countries are quite down. Yeah? This is just to show the trend between um, pre-Arab and post-Arab spring. And we can see in Iraq, for example, in Djibouti, for example, in Syria, for example, big dips. In Yemen, we actually see some positive numbers here improving. So it seems like Arab Spring was good for Yemen in terms of MCV1 coverage. I'm presenting the data on MCV2 because, like I mentioned, we're going to be discussing second year of life quite a bit. So here we see a bit of a dip in terms of overall coverage from 88% for MCV1 to 85%. Now, a bit of a shift. What do Egypt, Iran, Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, and Tunisia have in common? Any guesses? Come on. What do they have in common? Well, economically, they're almost all what? Low middle income countries. Yeah, they're in the middle income range, economically, right? I mean, Syria was also in that range until recently, and we, frankly, we don't know exactly, but we guess it's not anymore. But what else? They don't have PCV in their schedules. You have? I looked, uh, so we looked online as well. We looked on JRF. I think we have some data issues on It JRF. was introduced last year. Last year. Yeah. So it wasn't in the JRFs, and that's the data oh, source okay. we refer yeah. to. Yeah. <laughs> so please, a word of caution. JRF matters, not just for these presentations, but for global speculations, OK? Is it in the whole country, or is it uh, it's the whole country? OK. So good to know. I'm glad I put it up here. So Lebanon is still a middle-income country, though. So that part that they have in common. And they have PCV. OK. So microplans. Just one slide on the microplans uh, from the JRF. And this is somewhat of a positive news, because we see a lot of the countries are quite active in updating their microplans, which is useful for the purpose of this workshop, because we know whatever we learn here, extra materials, will go back and update our microplans. So that covers the regional and global updates. And now I'd like to go into the crux of the presentation, which is on equity. And Amiri, you have to stay awake, OK? I don't care about the jet lag. So all this reminds me of Mark Twain's quote that all generalizations are false, including this one, right? A few words about the differences between equity and equality. Because we hear these words all the time, right? And we, I think, use them interchangeably. But they're not the same. So equality in health refers to the objective measures of differences, OK? Objective measures of differences. So for example, when we look at DTP3 coverage by gender between boys and girls, these are based on uh, mix and DHS data, which are available online. And if they're not correct, it's not my fault. The countries own them. So we see between boys and girls, 
apparently globally and in our region, we don't see much difference in terms of coverage. Okay? I think all of you can attest to that. So then most of us in the room say, you see, we don't have any gender problems. But in fact, gender issues are much more subtle. And when we look at mother's education, and we stratify based on no education versus secondary education, what have you, we see huge discrepancy right, in coverage. So children born to mothers who are better educated are typically have, are more va are vaccinated versus those who are not. So this is where gender empowerment, women empowerment, all of that comes into play. So we do have gender issues we need to think about. Or when we look at geography, for example, we see a few countries struggling in coverage between their urban and rural populations. When we look at wealth, which is the most probably important predictor of equal coverage, we see the same thing. Difference between the poorest and the less poorest, I guess, or wealthiest versus least uh, or poorest. We see a big discrepancy in coverage. And I have data for you for all the countries, uh, thanks to WHO's HEAT, um, in fact, uh, tool. They're available, readily available online, and you're welcome to play with them. I, I will show you, and there are other colleagues in this room who can show you. And you can see, basically, the differences we see in terms of urban, in terms of education. In Egypt, all these data are available. I'm not going to go through all of these just to show you that they're available. And it's good to go through them and see how our DTP3 coverage or MCB1 coverage vary depending on residence, wealth, sex, so on and so forth. Yeah? Iraq. And I think Iraq is coming out with new data, right? Soon? As far as I know. Okay. Jordan. I think Jordan is also soon. You're going to have more recent data, I think. The last data you had, 2011, 2012. I think you're going to have 2017. Very good. Sudan, we have mixed 2010. Basically, when you see these bars, they indicate differences in coverage, OK? So you are able to reach your children, some of them at least, if they are in wealthier families, if they're in urban settings, if they're born to educated mothers. So you're able to reach them obviously, according to the data. But you're missing out on the, in, the ones that are not conveniently located, for example. Yeah? The ones that are hard to reach, the ones that are in the slums. And then another measure we use to look at equity and immunization is looking at the district coverage. And here we see, of course, between 2010 and 2016, pre and post Arab Spring, we see differences in uh, what's uh, the effect of those uh, uh, upheavals in your countries. So now, back to equality versus equity. And by the way, this, uh, I, oops. this particular uh, image I found on Google, and uh, it seems like every time I look on Google for this image, something is added. So there's equality and equity at first, a couple of years ago, and then reality was added. And then liberation's added, and then I wonder what's you know, next year. So now, we, if equality is about the objective measure of differences, equity goes deeper. Equity is the explanatory variables, the reason behind the reasons. Okay? It's about the issues of justice and fairness. It's about the avoidable differences. Okay? It's about the distribution of the resources, distribution of power, and the social arrangements in a society that then impact the work we do and then the visible differences we see between urban and uh, rural and what have you. So equity is central, of course, to GVAP, central to MVAP. It's central to UNICEF's work. And of course, it's very important immunization because of the greater health impact and economic development. It also makes economic sense. As a recent study came out, sponsored by UNICEF, narrowing the gap, 
for every $1 million invested in the health of the poorest children, we see nearly twice as many deaths prevented. So it's cost effective. It's costly. Equity is costly, but it's cost effective. Okay? And I had a video here which I'm not going to show you now because I don't want to deal with turning this on and off again. But to address equity, one has to really understand the social determinants of health. These are, as you know, the conditions in which people are born into, grow, live, work, age. Right? These are circumstances that are shaped by the distribution of money, power, and resources, and the social arrangements. In fact, a study showed that as much as 50% of the reduction in under five child mortality were due to factors outside of the health sector, okay? Such as education, clean water, women's empowerment, right? So what are some of these outside factors which shape basically the resource allocation, which speak to issues of equity? Right? So this is a, this is a, uh, there are many composite indicators. I selected the one from the World Bank, which looks at governance. And governance, as you know, is about how resources are managed to achieve the outcomes, the desired outcomes. Okay? So most of the countries in our region, this is uh, MENA countries, of course. You can see MENA. And these are composite indicators on voice and accountability, political stability, government eff effectiveness, and so on and so forth, and corruption. Most of our countries are hovering around 40, 50 percent range, 100 being the best. And the countries like Canada, US, in Europe, they're mostly in the 80, 90, 100 percent range. And our countries are mostly, as you can see, below 50 percent range. Why is that important? Because it impacts the equity of public resource use, right? So these are the patterns of public expenditure and revenue collection, which affect the poor especially. And we don't have good data from our region, in fact, only from three countries, that uh, Djibouti, Sudan, and Yemen, and they are in the me middle range. You know, high being greater than 3.5, which are very dark colors, which we don't see anyway, and then we see our countries are mostly in this range. So we have quite a bit of work to do, but it shouldn't be surprising given the previous indica uh, indicator. So those previous indicators then affect how we distribute our resources for healthcare, right? So total health expenditure as percentage of GDP, right? WHO recommends this indicator based on the relative, basically uh, health expenditure relative to the wealth of the country. General government health expenditure as part of general government expenditure. And this is a, this is, WHO uses the indicator as uh, to understand the level of commitment a government makes to the health area. Target is 15%, globally at 15.5. Look at most of our countries. These are the countries actually in this room. This is not all of our countries. All below the global average. Out-of-pocket expenditure. This is about the calamity or catastrophe that uh, individual faces in the region. 18% out-of-pocket on average. Look at all of our countries. This is what you pay out of your pocket, what your friends and family pay out of pocket to access health service in your country. Okay? These are all issues related to equity, folks. That's why I'm going through it. Out of pocket as percentage of private health expenditure. So private health expenditure is us, the NGOs, basically anything non-public sector. 45% average globally, and look at our countries. <laughs> we dominate the private sector expenditure, basically. And then this reflects the density of the physicians that we have per 1,000 population. We see they're quite low, ex with the exception of Sudan, which we know, in fact, they're exporting, I think, physicians. And density of nursing and midwifery personnel. Again, quite low, with the exception of few. So going back to the 
key message here. Addressing inequities in immunization is not only a moral imperative, which I think is intuitive, as I mentioned to all of us, but also makes economic and programmatic sense. I think economic sense also we covered. Is we know it's cost effective based on the latest literature, right? But it also makes programmatic sense. Because for us to reach that last child who is born into a poor family in rural area or in slums to an uneducated parent, we cannot do business as usual. And that's why we're in this room, to deal with that special population, transient population, moving from one side to another, finding them and vaccinating them, we cannot do business as usual. And once we do reach them and vaccinate them, that's where we're going to see this stagnation stop and actually go upward again. But we cannot wait for perfect information, perfect everything to do our job. Because as this quote indicates, by the time we have perfect information or perfect everything, it's like having children. There's no perfect time to have children, by the way, right? You just have to do it. So by the time we have perfect information, the world has moved on. Yeah, so let's not wait for perfect information to take the next step.